All right, we are live. Excellent news. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. I hope you are having a good day and that you and your loved ones are staying safe. Uh, I'm Maria Wickvila, and I am so excited that GMAT Club has asked me back uh, again to speak with all of you and to share my thoughts on today. We're going to be talking about is a top MBA worth it, right? What are some of the pros and the cons of, you know, I think there's so much emphasis on getting in and getting accepted and I have to get accepted and I have to get accepted. And then in my work as an admissions consultant, I sometimes I work with people and they get in and then they're like, oh, but now I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> And I'm like, whoa, we just did all this work. Uh, and now, you know, maybe you should have thought of this stuff earlier. So in today's session, I am going to talk to you about what I think some of the, the key uh, facets or considerations are if you are considering enrolling in a top MBA program. So let me pull up my screen share. Okay. PowerPoint slideshow. All right, you should see my slides right now. So let's jump right into it. Uh, before, uh, yeah, before we sort of move along and get going, I am going to quickly tell you some of the things we're going to cover today. Uh, first of all, what is like a top MBA anyway? People sort of throw that term around pretty loosely. Um, you know, spoiler alert, I don't think it really matters. I don't think that a technical like cutoff, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you a little bit why. Um, I think one of the biggest facets of applying or to at attending a top business school is this element of sticker shock. Uh, it's a very expensive degree and scholarships are not nearly as available as they are for other um, types of graduate study in particular because it's not like you're, if you were to study something like you know, how to cure cancer, well, okay, as a university, I'd be happy to pay for your tuition because you might help humanity, but usually MBA students uh, are doing it to advance their careers and ergo, the scholarships are available, but they are certainly not as plentiful as they are either for undergraduate uh, studies or for other types of graduate fields. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's not even just about the money. It's not just about that return on investment. Uh, it's about the network. And that is where the ultimate value comes from. So now let's dig in. But super quick, in case you haven't met me before or seen me before. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Maria. There's a picture of me that just magically appeared thanks to the magic of PowerPoint. I am a 2005 graduate of Harvard Business School. Uh, and I'm also the founder of Applicant Lab. Uh, Applicant Lab, in case you haven't heard of it, is the DIY online platform in, in which I've taken all of my knowledge. I am now entering my 17th year this year of providing admissions advice. Uh, and so I take all of that knowledge and instead of charging you hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour for it, I've put it all into a bunch of videos and exercises that you can access for a teeny fraction of the price. Uh, so I don't know if you've looked at what MBA admissions consultants charge, but here I've pulled up a few recent um, sort of screenshots. Uh, so 365 an hour, 480 an hour, and some of them are even at $500 an hour or more. So that's a lot of money. Um, and so what I've done with Applicant Lab here, sort of a quick screenshot to give you a sense. It walks you through every step you need in the MBA process, the same exact advice that I would give you if I were sitting with you side by side, but instead of charging you $350 an hour, uh, since it's all sort of pre-recorded, I only charge you $350 total. <laughs> so you get hundreds of hours worth of advice for only the cost of one hour. So um, it's pretty cool. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, I won. I since I went to Harvard Business School, I was able to uh, attend and compete in the new the new venture competition for alumni entrepreneurs. I won the audience favorite vote in my regional competition. Uh, I'm the only MBA admissions service that is endorsed by the Harbus, which is the official student newspaper of the Harvard Business School. And since we're on GMAT Club right now, uh, after this is over, go check, Matt, check me out. Check out my reviews on GMAT Club. They are all real. They are all verified. They are all real people. Uh, I'm up to 116 right now and counting. Okay, so what is a top 10 MBA anyway? Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here like rehashing everything that's been done about rankings before uh, because uh, also after we're done here, uh, <laughs> make a little note to yourself that you can look on YouTube and you can search for my name and Shovik. Uh, and a couple of months ago, I think in April, we did a full session on dissecting the rankings and, you know, are the rankings, are the rankings bull uh, or are they not? For the record, Shovik chose that title, not me. 
<laughs> Although I agree with his assertion, I think the rankings are bull. Um, but so anyway, so I'm not going to rehash all of that here, uh, but I did want to point out a few key elements of it in case you missed that presentation a couple months ago. Um, so here we've got side by side the different top 10-ish roughly rankings um, from some of the th three of the most famous rankings publishers. The, the one all the way on the left is the Financial Times, the one in the middle is Forbes, and the one all the way on the right is US News and World Report. Um, and I just wanted to point out really quickly that like, there's so much variation. <laughs> like, really, that should automatically make you a little suspicious, right? The fact that there's so much variation from list to list to list should make you say, like, hmm, maybe the rankings really aren't all that scientific. Uh, so, for example, Harvard Business School and the Financial Times is the number one business school in the world. According to Forbes, it's the number four uh, in the US. And according to US News last year, it was number six. Uh, similarly, Chicago Booth, according to Forbes, is number one. According to US News, it's number three. It's tied for third. Uh, but then according to the Financial Times, it's 10th. <laughs> so automatically, I'm not going to get into the different, you know, criterion, criter criteria that they use, but really, how, how can there be this much variation uh, if these rankings really are kind of, you know, set in stone and done with very high tech and scientific precision? They're not done with any precision. So um, I, I think the, one of the quick takeaways I want you to know from my last session was the rankings are not at all designed to help you the applicant figure out what the best program is for you. It's not about that. It's about generating buzz and controversy and clicks, and they want bloggers to pick it up. And oh my God, Harvard fell to six. Ah, let's all talk about it. And let's drive a lot of traffic to US News because they made it, right? So you have to look at these with a little bit of cynicism. Um, they, are, they are directionally useful, but the actual ranking between fourth versus fifth, who cares? Um, also, I wanted to make it clear that the top MBA really does vary based upon your career goals. Uh, universities have very, very different specializations in the MBA program. So while every MBA program is going to cover the basics of accounting and finance and operations and marketing, um, after you get beyond that core, those sort of core classes, foundational classes, the specialties and the strengths of those specialties can vary wildly. So for example, if you are interested in switching your career into real estate, in my opinion, the number one school in the US is Columbia Business School. Uh, or if you want to go work in Hollywood, guess what? One of the best schools in all of the US for you to go to is UCLA or USC because you'll be based out here uh, and in a pre and hopefully post corona world, you can use that networking to your advantage to get all kinds of job opportunities that even people at Harvard don't get. Uh, and then so nobody asked me, <laughs> but if they were to ask me and say, okay, Maria, well, little Miss Smarty Pants, if you think the rankings are so flawed, how would you redo the rankings? And I think it would be very easy. I would ask, you know, 100,000, what is it, 200,000 people a year take the GMAT or something like that. I'd ask all of them, here's a list of a bunch of schools. If you were accepted to all of these schools and if price had no consideration, which one would you go to? And then whichever one people hit first, that would be ranked first. And whichever one people ring, you know, pick second, people, you know, that would be ranked second. Uh, and the reason I say that is that, you know, like, when these when these rankings publishers court all of this controversy by saying like oh my gosh this year this school has dropped from number whatever to number whatever uh like does that really impact like you know if if let's say i were applying to business school this year and harvard had had fallen from first to sixth in the us news rankings would i have been like oh maybe i shouldn't go to harvard of course not i totally would have still gone to harvard i i, I totally would have still it was it would have been my first choice either way um so you know, just though, however, for the sake of argument, in case you are kind of new to this world and you're just kind of dipping your toe in the proverbial waters, um, I, I think it is it is directionally correct to think about the schools in terms of these buckets of of eliteness. Um, so I would group in that top bucket: Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, followed by Columbia, MIT, Booth, Kellogg, Ish. Then Haciel Ross Tuck, Duke, Darting, Cornell, NYU, UCLA. And to be clear, like these are not these are not scientific. Like these are just kind of me off the top of my head being like, well, I think here's where I'd roughly put them. But the point is that all of these schools right here are in fact top MBA programs. And as we're going to see in just a second, most of these schools can lead to such 
very, I think, surprisingly and shockingly similar career outcomes. So please stop obsessing over these the silly minutiae of like, well, I don't know, this school is now ranked 3.2 and it used to be ranked 3.1. Like, who cares? Uh, there are so many other things to think about, but just in general, these are the top top-ish programs at least in the US. Uh, and then if we're talking about not US, then of course, in Sayad, uh, London Business School, IE, and US and Singapore, SEEBS in uh, no, Shanghai, sorry, uh, those would also be added to this list. So right off the bat, when people start looking into these top MBA programs after, you know, kind of looking at the, the GMAT scores and the, the admission statistics, uh, I think it's really useful for people to also look at the cost <laughs> of what it costs to get uh, an MBA. And I, I took this, I have to credit poets and quants for assembling this information. Uh, but basically what they did is, I think they did this last year, they, they took the total cost of attendance. So the schools tend to focus on the tuition numbers, like that's the first number that jumps out at people. However, there are so many other costs, primarily living expenses. Uh, and if you're in a more expensive city, for example, if you're going to school in New York City, um, you might have to pay a lot more in rent than if you were going to school at in Indiana, for example, right? A more a more uh, rural suburban part of the country versus the elite, uh, you know, most cosmopolitan metropolis in the U.S. Uh, and other schools will also have different, you know, different fees and you know different activities. And some of them will, um, you know, everyone has to do some sort of a a trip, a global trip. And so, well, guess what? Who's going to pay for the global trip? The money for that doesn't just materialize magically out of the money tree that you've built and you planted in your backyard. No, you're going to have to pay for that trip. So, what what poets and quants did is they they put together this this list is the two year estimate a total cost. So tuition, books, food, lodging, anything else, that ski trip to Vail or whatever else it is you're doing with your classmates. And these are their rough estimates. So we're talking a, a, almost, you know, almost about a quarter of a million dollars um, all in at the end of the two years. And so this is sort of like this moment of, I think, sticker shock uh, where Again, I have been so surprised over the years when I work with people and we spend months together and we're going back and forth on the thing and the essays and then the mock interviews. And then they, so they finally get accepted and then they're like, oh my God, Maria, have you seen how much these schools cost? And I'm like, yes, of course I've seen how much they cost. Like that. <laughs> where where have you been? Like I try to be, I, I'm nicer about it to their face, but I'm thinking to myself like, where have you been? Like, of course that's what it costs. Um, and so I want you to be very clear up front that yeah, look, you're gonna have to, you know, you may have to pay a lot of money, um, especially if you don't get a scholarship. Now, that's the bad news, but let's focus a little bit more on the good news. Um, if you if you look at the average starting salary uh, for people who graduate from these programs, and of course there's variability, right? If you work in uh, something like a hedge fund or private equity company, you will be making more than this. Uh, if you're working in the nonprofit sector, you will of course be making less. Now, the good news is, Many top schools do have loan forgiveness programs for people who enter the nonprofit sector. So don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm Maria, my, my heart is really in social enterprise and that's what I want to do. And how can I ever do a social enterprise with my life if these are the costs? Well, don't, I mean, some, not all programs, but some programs do offer uh, loan forgiveness if you do end up entering the nonprofit sector after graduation. Uh, but so if we look at the starting salaries, like already in the first year, and this is obviously an oversimplification because it doesn't account for taxes or whatever, but you know, you're know you already making about half of that total cost back in terms of your gross salary in the first year. Um, and also don't forget, you get about 25, 30, 20, 25, 30 years to pay back your student loans. And uh, I looked up, I was doing a little research last night and I found that most graduates from top MBA programs pay back, fully pay back their loans within 10 years of graduating. Uh, and anecdotally, I can tell you that that is correct. Even though I, after business school, did not go into a high compensation field. I was working in the media industry. I was working in a startup in the media industry. So that was like sort of two double whammies of like the low income, try, you know, of, you know, two, two reasons to not be making a ton of money at the same time. Uh, and even I was able to pay back my loans within within less than 10 years. So um, don't don't forget, once the sticker shop wears off, don't forget that afterwards, uh, you can have the potential to make a, a significantly higher compensation level that will help you pay off that debt. Uh, and so I wouldn't think about it in terms of 
you know, oh my gosh, I have to, you know, Maria, I have to sign on the dotted line for this loan right now. And it's $170,000. And that's like, that could buy me a house in Nebraska. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot in Applicant Lab is the fact that when admissions officers are looking at your profile, and they're looking at you within that broader applicant pool, one of the things they're really trying to figure out is who amongst you, which ones of you are going to be the most successful, with success being broadly defined, of course, but who's going to be the most successful in kind of like the 25-year time frame, right? So they're not necessarily looking just at that post MBA job. They're looking at like, okay, who do we think here has the potential based upon their previous uh, accomplishments? Who do we think is going to really rise to the top? Whether that is in a traditional CEO of a Fortune 500 company way, or it's establishing a groundbreaking nonprofit that really helps solve a desperate societal need, whatever that top or success means, they're looking for people who in the long term are going to reach that level of success. Um, and so they're looking at it with a 25 year ish time horizon. The lenders are looking at it with a 25 year ish time horizon. And so I would urge you to look at it with a 25 year time horizon. Uh, so here's an oversimplification. I know it's ignoring interest. It's ignoring all, you know, it's ignoring some potential savings. Like, yeah, maybe you might make, get a partial scholarship. And so maybe it'll be 200,000 instead of 220,000. But just for the sake of the numbers being round and easy, because it's early in the morning for me. And so I like easy numbers when it's early in the morning. Let's say that the cost of getting a top MBA is roughly $250,000. And let's think about your life over the next 25 years. If I did the math right, which I think I did, uh, that comes out to about $10,000 per year in terms of for each of the 25 years you've got left of your career, roughly, you will be paying an extra $10,000 for that, for having gotten that degree. And so I think one of the ways that I, I can, I try to urge people to think about it is, do you think that your earnings potential over the course of your career will on average be at least $10,000 a year more than it would have been if you would have not gotten the MBA. Uh, and I, and the reason I like to, to set up this thought experiment is that when I do it, most people say like, actually, when you put it that way, you know, 25 years, I have a lot of time to pay it back. You know, if need be, like one of the things I did to help pay off my loans pretty quickly is I lived very frugally. <laughs> I am very good at living very frugally, right? So some of my business school classmates graduated and I remember one of them bought a Porsche. Uh, and, you know, I did not buy a Porsche. I bought like a used, sensible, mid-sized car. Um, I did not live in the, I did not live in, you know, the Hollywood Hills. I was living in a more uh, modest neighborhood. Uh, but so, you know, I, I was like, look, I, I really, my goal right now is to pay off these loans and I don't need the fancy stuff. So you can also, a lot of it is under your control after you graduate in terms of, you know, even if you can't control um, the salary necessarily that you might be making, you can definitely control your expenses and, and be, you know, can I at least to myself, do I think I can eke out either $10,000 a year more in earnings and or can I make several thousand dollars a year worth of cuts in living expenses um, to make up that difference? And so when I put it that way, most people are like, actually, yeah, when you put it that way, that's that seems really feasible. And if at this moment you're looking at this and you're like, Maria, it actually doesn't seem feasible at all. This is really, it's still really scary. I don't know. Like, I'm really scared about this. Here's, here's what I would lovingly uh, but critically say back to you and I would push back on you and say, look, here's the thing. Full-time MBA programs are actually loss leaders. And by that, I mean the schools themselves do not really make any profit on the MBA program where they make all of their profit is in the executive education uh, and or the publishing arm of the school. So for example, Harvard Business Review, I don't know if you've ever if you've ever purchased it or if you've ever read it. It is not a cheap magazine. It's pretty pricey. Uh, and you know, Harvard also publishes a bunch of case studies that then other business schools and people purchase. So the MBA program itself is actually a loss a loss leader for them. They don't make money on the MBA students, even the ones who are paying uh, full freight. Uh, and so I think what I would say why would I would say to someone who's like, oh, it's still too much is so, okay, here's the thing. If an MBA program 
Hmm. Think of an MBA program in, in admissions office, it, almost like venture capitalists. But instead of investing in companies, trying to pick which of these companies, which ones are going to be the winners and which ones are going to go away, they're kind of doing that with people. And so they're trying to pick which of the people are going to be the winners in the sort of career horse race. I am mixing my metaphors all over. Whew. But do you see what I'm saying? Like they're trying to pick the people within this applicant pool that we think are going to be the ones who advance to the top of their fields. And so we're taking a bet as admissions officers. We're taking a bet on you. We're taking a risk. We, however, are willing to invest in you by accepting you into our MBA program. And so if, an, if you're not willing to make that investment in yourself, if you're not willing to take a chance on yourself, and if you're not willing to take on that level of risk, what I would lovingly but critically say to you is then why should an MBA program take that risk on you? Right. It's got to it's got to be a two way street. If you're if they're going to take a risk on you and a chance on you, you've got to be confident enough in yourself that you are willing to take that risk uh, on yourself. So uh, it's not just, though, about the money and the calculations and let's divide this. And I'm sure right now I can't see the chat box right now because I have my full screen on my PowerPoint. But I'm sure someone right now is like, but you're you're you know, that two hundred and fifty thousand. you are not accounting for interest payments and the compounding interest and the what I know I'm not. But it's just a per it's just an, sort of for the purposes of illustration. Uh, but moving beyond money, even beyond my overly simplified purposes of illustration examples. Um, Let's not forget that business school, it's actually school. This is another thing that I, people, when they're applying, they tend to somehow sort of forget. Um, the biggest way in which people forget this is when they say things like, oh, you know, I'm just not a good test taker. I've never been that comfortable with numbers. I don't do well under pressure. When they're like, for example, explaining away why they got a lousy GMAT score, for example, and they're like, oh, I'm just not very good. And, and I'm like, well, it's school. Like, guess what? You're going to have pressure in school to do well. You know, I'm not good with numbers under pressure. Guess what? <laughs> what do you think that what do you think that finance test is going to be your second week when you have that exam come out of nowhere? Like it's going to you have to you have to be smart. You have to study and be good with numbers or at least comfortable with them. Um, so you, when you get to business school, you actually take classes. <laughs> uh, and some of those classes, most of them, not all. I'm going to be honest, but most of those classes are actually pretty useful. Um, not just the ones that teach you those core business skills or those electives in those areas of business that are interesting for you, but also those, the kind of people management classes are so useful. Negotiating or managing teams, that sort of stuff, man, that is gold. That, that, that sort of knowledge is pure gold uh, because you're going to need to know how to lead and manage others. I mean, no matter where you end up going with your life, it's a valuable skill set to have, right? So the sorts of things you learn in business school can be useful. Sure, if you want to go for the, what is it, the brass ring or whatever and become a Fortune 500 CEO, great, go for it. The MBA can be useful there. But it's also useful if you decide to start your own nonprofit, either as your full-time profession or something on the side that you do on the weekends in your spare time. Uh, or even if you, you know, this is sort of more topical for me as a mother, uh, but you know, even the kid, like if you ever have kids, that kid and that kids goes to school, which hopefully they will all go to school, there's gonna be like a PTA association, a parent teacher association that's gonna have to be run. I have to raise money and have to budget the money and have to convince people to donate and all those good things uh, that you learn in business school are actually also useful in contexts like that. So don't forget about the fact that you will be actually learning uh, in business school. That having been said, I do want to point out that the, the book knowledge, a lot of the class knowledge, uh, it, as a lot of it is obsolete, uh, or maybe you might forget some of it after a few years after you graduate, right? So in terms of the, the immediate payback or the immediate benefit of that knowledge, that's going to happen almost immediately in those first one or two jobs you get uh, out of business school. You know, I graduated in business school from business school in 2005. Uh, and I, so just to sort of give you a sense, this was before YouTube existed. This was before the iPhone existed. Um, Netflix at that point was a company that was sending DVDs to your house. Uh, and Facebook, Facebook had just launched like a year. They had, they had launched at Harvard uh, a couple of years or sort of privately with a few different schools, but they sort of opened publicly, I think around that time. 
Um, and it's funny, I sat next to a guy in a class who was like, I'm going to go to a company called Facebook. And I'm like, Facebook, what's that? <laughs> and he was like, it's a social network. And I'm like, oh, you mean like Friendster? And he's like, no, it's a little bit better than Friendster. And I'm like, well, is it like um, MySpace? And he's like, no, it's my. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy's a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> like there's already so many social networks. Why do we need another one for? And he retired like <laughs> he's super rich. Uh, but the point is like right now you're looking at me and you're like, wow, she's so old. 15 years ago, she's so obsolete. She's such a dinosaur. Guess what? 15 years from now, there's you're going to be in the same boat, right? You're going to be middle aged too. And you're going to be like, oh, there's all these new technologies that didn't exist. So my point is some of the learning that you get in business school um, and one of the reasons, as a side note, I'm such a big fan of case-based learning is that the cases are meant by design to try to teach you timeless principles using specific examples. Um, and so the hope is that even if the world changes completely and all of a sudden people start watching movies on their phones, which is something that was incomprehensible <laughs> when I graduated uh, so many years ago, even when the world changes so dramatically, you are a lot of those lessons will still be applicable, but just maybe not as directly applicable. Um, so my little pro tip to you, if you do end up going to business school, is take as many of the people, leadership, you know, change management, negotiations, um, you know, leadership workshops. If there's anything where it's like they record you as you're like telling people bad news, like those things are gold because that is something that never human human nature is not obsolete. Human nature does not change. At least it hasn't changed a whole lot uh, recently. So those classes really are timeless. Um, and at a certain point, I'd say maybe sort of five years post MBA, maybe maybe ten years, but closer to five, uh, your future success down the line really does depend upon what your successes have been in the workplace post MBA. Uh, and so I think I think this is good news. I did want to point this out because I think a lot of people who either don't get into any business school at all, or who get into perhaps a school that was not as fancy as they were hoping. I, I just want to point out that like that doesn't really matter in the long term. Like if you go out into a, your chosen industry and you kick lots of butt and you're just amazing and you develop a strong reputation, that person, no matter with an MBA, without an MBA, uh, is going to do better than the person who went to Harvard Business School, but who was really lazy and who nobody likes. <laughs> right. So at least please don't stress out about your, like, I'm not going to have a future if I don't go to the school. Like, no, I actually, I know people from HBS, well, one person in particular who is chronically unemployed uh, because this person has a difficult personality and they keep getting fired. So to be clear, it's not like a magic, it's not a magic thing. And also, for example, my husband, who I met at Harvard Business School, you know, he's a CFO in an industry in which most of his peers uh, because we are in Los Angeles and he is in the entertainment industry, most of the other CFOs went to UCLA or USC here in Los Angeles, right? So, you know, that, that them going to a school that was ranked, whatever, 15th or whatever, guess what? Didn't really hold them back now, did it? So I just wanted to make that little side note. And also, now that we've talked about the education, sort of the pros and the cons and the value and maybe some of the stuff that isn't as valuable, um, I want to I wanted to transition a little bit to the real the real benefit. So uh, this happened before many of you were born, but when Bill Clinton was running for president in nineteen, uh, God, when did he he started his campaign in ninety two? I think. Oh no, he was running in ninety two. I'm sorry. So his his he had this advisor uh, who was really really famous for saying to him like it's the economy stupid right just focus your campaign on the economy 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 and that's how you're going to win this election so i'm going to uh to rephrase this in my own way and it's the network stupid i don't mean to call you stupid i probably should have crossed that out <laughs> it's a little aggressive sounding but really it's it's really about the network at the end of the day in terms of the value that you get from attending a top mba um, and here I'm going to jump into a few cliches and sometimes cliches are over, you know, they're overused, but they're overused for a reason. A lot of times cliches are overused because they're true. Um, so one of the, one of the reasons why the network from business school is so valuable is this kind of chicken and egg problem in terms of, yes, business schools will graduate, uh, chickens who go on to be very successful chickens, but that's because they accept eggs who were already on their way to be successful anyway, right? So, you know, sometimes people say like, oh, well, you know, I'm not successful yet. 
I haven't been, I haven't had a strong career yet, but that's because that's why I need to go to business school, right? That's because I haven't gotten that MBA degree. And at the top business schools, at least, unfortunately, for the most part, the causality, the business school does not make you successful. It's successful people get into the business school, right? So that's that sort of chicken, there is a chicken and egg uh, thing that happens, or sort of as a side note, how I like to say, it's Harvard, it's not Hogwarts, right? So if you go to a place like Harvard Business School, yes, it's gonna be an amazing experience. You're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna have great professors, whatever, but it's not Hogwarts, right? It's not like, you know, somebody like shows up at Harvard Business School, let's say somebody sneaks in through the admissions filter and they're not actually like that smart or they're not actually like, they don't have very good leadership skills or whatever. It's not like going to Harvard is going to, there's not like a magic wand that the admissions, you know, that the administration has and they wave the magic wand and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I'm now the most beautiful girl in the ball and now I can do magic too. Like it, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't transform you that much. So business school builds upon people's existing strengths, but it doesn't like, it's not like, oh, look, now I've turned into a pumpkin. And, and like, no, it's not, it's not a magical, fictitious <laughs> type of uh, experience. So going back to the chicken and the egg, um, not only do business schools let in the eggs that pretty much seem like they're on the track to become good chickens. Um, another reason why the network is important is because a rising tide lifts all boats. So if a school lets in consistently people who become successful chickens, <laughs> again, I'm mixing my metaphors, but if people let in, if schools let in people who are going to be successful, who are on the way to be successful, and they let in 500 people, and let's say 450 of those 500 people go out into the world and become successful, they are going to become successful and they're going to help their peers become successful. And that peer is going to help the other peer become successful. And so that idea of the rising tide uh, lifting all boats is a really important factor in attending an elite MBA. Uh, put another way, birds of a feather flock together. Uh, or to put it the way one of my management professors said, uh, A players like to be on teams with other A players, right? And by that, he meant high achievers like to be around other high achievers. High achievers get really frustrated when they're on a team with someone who is perhaps not a high achiever. Uh, and so the reason this is important is that the business school is going to let in someone who has a track record right now of making good things happen in the hopes that in the future, right, if right now is time equals n, that in time n equals, you know, n plus one, and then n plus n, you know, n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, n plus four, that it becomes this cycle of people who are making good things happen now are going to then go out into the world and continue to make good things happen. And then they, because they made good things happen later, they're going to then be chosen to make good things happen even more. And the idea or the hope at least is that it's going to become this positive synergistic cycle. Um, and so it's the reason why the network is so valuable because you're this sort of person who makes good things happen. And so now at business school, you're gonna be surrounded by other people who are also this sort of person. And so this is you, let's say this is you by yourself, but now here's the network and the network is full of people who have this cycle today, tomorrow, 15, 20, 30 years from now. Um, and so let me give you some, some tangible examples. Uh, most of these examples are gonna come from my husband's career because he has a more sort of traditional corporate path. I sort of want the social enterprise, social entrepreneurship route. Uh, but so for him, for example, um, so he's, like I said before, he's a CFO of an entertainment company. And so, you know, he has, as a CFO, unsurprisingly, he works with banks a lot. <laughs> He's frequently working with banks. And so he's got his professional relationships with banks, but sometimes he's got like little questions about like, oh my God, I have to do some sort of foreign exchange transaction and I have to buy euros. And guess what? One of his best friends from business school is a foreign exchange specialist. And so he will call her up in the middle of the day and be like, dude, I need to buy euros. What should I do? And she, because she's a genius at this, will be like, oh, hold off, you know, wait until next week because Boris Johnson is going to do, you know, whatever. Uh, and so that network has helped that person in his network has helped him be better at his job. 
Um, another thing that can be useful is for healthcare, for example, this one is not so much health, this one is not so much career related, but you know, this is actually an example for me. Um, I was, you know, I was part of a women's networking group at HBS and one of the women there has gone on to, uh, be a marketing leader or one of the leaders of an osteoporosis medication thing at a, at a, at a pharmaceutical company. And my mother has osteoporosis. And so like, I'm literally, I was literally able to like drop her an email and be like, dude, my mom just got diagnosed with this. What should she do? What medicine should she take? Obviously, you know, and my, and of course my friend was like, yeah, I'm, you know, just because I happen to work for an osteoporosis medicine, like I'm not good. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best one for your mom. But so she was able to like immediately be like, boom, 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 boom. Here's what you need to do. Here are the questions you need to ask. Here's the, and I was like, oh, thank God, this is awesome. Um, real estate kind of on a, on a personal level, you know, a lot of, a lot of us, uh, in life start to realize that real estate is one of the most consistent ways to build wealth. <laughs> I wish someone would have told me that 20 years ago. Um, and so when you have, again, if you're like looking to buy a house, you know, when we were looking to purchase our place, guess who, guess who my husband called? He called all of his friends who work in real estate and had them like, they did some analyses about the ROI and whatever about our neighborhood. Um, on the nonprofit side, knowing people in nonprofit, my husband was on a nonprofit board. He he is the head of one nonprofit board, and then he was also serving, but that nonprofit's kind of small. Uh, but then he was asked to serve on a nonprofit board for another much, much, much larger uh, organization. And he was like in over his head a little, and he was like, boom, I'm just going to call one of my classmates who runs a nonprofit in the education space and say, here's what I'm, ta what I'm wrestling with. Can you help me tackle it? Um, on the retail side of things, you know, knowing people who end up going into, you know, working for places like Target or Best Buy. Uh, these are sort of, if you're not in the U.S., these are very large. These are like the Tesco's uh, of of the U.S. And so, randomly, my husband's company for like a year decided that they were going to try to get into the retail game. And so, again, he's able to call people and be like, "Hey." Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about your your world. Can you please give me a crash tutorial? Um, SaaS software as a service. So this is also for him, for his job, especially like they're always doing pay new different payroll, HR, uh, software, software types of things. And so knowing people who work at like, say, Salesforce, uh, which one of our friends up until very recently, a very good friend of ours did. That's great. You call her up and she's like, yeah, let me tell you about Salesforce and what you need to think about for your CRM system. Um, video games, his company also launched a video game division that he was like running for a while. It's a long story. But again, we have a couple of friends who work at Riot Games and Activision Blizzard. Um, for me, on the venture capital side, when I was looking to raise, I was considering perhaps raising venture capital uh, or some sort of like social enterprise venture capital type of thing. For Applicant Lab, I was able to talk to people in that space who gave me the very unvarnished pros and cons of that world. Um, and also for me, uh, I have I have a partnership with Applicant Lab with uh, you know uh, some uh, editors that a friend of mine from business school he started an MBA admissions consulting company and he's an entrepreneur in this space and so we were able to partner together. So, whew! I just why did I just do this? Because I want because people talk a lot about the network, right? The network, the network, the network, the network. But I feel like. And when I read articles or blog posts or whatever posts, I, I feel like there's not a lot of concrete necessarily, like it's not necessarily easy for someone who's not in the MBA world to picture like what people even talk about the network, but who cares? So my hope with this slide is that it helped give you a sense of like why the network matters, whether it's for your work or if you want to switch careers later. I almost once got a job that I should, I was completely unqualified to get. Um, I almost once got a job running marketing for a travel, a travel, digital travel startup. Uh, and I had 0.0. .0 I had, I was not, I was not qualified, but a former uh, section mate of mine had run digital marketing for, I think Expedia or Orbitz for what this was a while ago. Uh, and literally I called him, I'm like, dude, I have a job interview on Monday and I need to be able to BS my way through this. He spent like three hours with me on a Saturday morning being like, here's exactly how the digital travel industry works. Don't focus on airlines. No one makes any money on the airlines. All of the money is in cruises and tours. And I'm like, okay, all right. So then I, well, I got to my interview and I'm like, well, I mean, you know, everyone knows that there's there's no money in the airline tickets. It's all of the money is actually in cruises and tours, right? And I almost got the job, and I had no business almost getting that job just between just between the two of us. Shh.
a secret. Don't tell anyone. Um, okay. And then moving on to the final, the final point about the aspects of the network. You know, I, I mentioned this a little bit before about birds of a feather flocking together, A players wanting to hang out with other A players. Look, the fact is that if you go to a business school, a top business school, you're going to make lots of great friends. There's something to be said for being surrounded by other bright go-getters who, whatever their passion is, whatever their interest is, right? I have I have a section mate right now who's really in, who was really into the beer industry, and today he has his own craft brewery. Uh, you know, meeting these fascinating people who, in their own way, are just completely passionate about different parts of the world and different facets of the economy. Um, and just getting being surrounded by people who have that same energy as you and that same optimism and that same drive, guess what? You end up getting along with a lot of them. Not all of them. And there's there's a bunch of jerks too, of course. Like there's jerks in every organization. You, you put you put together a bunch of people, you're gonna get some jerks, just statistically speaking, for the most part, right? But that having been said, like you're gonna make amazing friends in business school because you all have, you know, I'm not at all interested in the beer industry, but I can appreciate my friend's passion that he brings and the energy that he brings. Uh, and I don't share another friend of ours passion for the real estate industry, but it's so cool to see, to talk to him about his projects and to see him get all excited about this like hotel that he's helping build. And uh, you know, and you just, you get, you end up connecting with people because we're, we're on that same sort of wavelength uh, of birds of a feather flocking together. And on a most minor side note, um, you know, if you're single, you might find a spouse like I did. Here's a picture of me at my wedding. Um, and I, you know, the joke is that you get your MRS degree at business school. I hate that joke. I did not go to business. I was not at all. I am so independent. I was like, I am not here to find a man. I am here to advance my career. Um, and then I just so happened to, I accidentally, I accidentally uh, ended up uh, finding my husband at business school. Um, so where, what are some conclusions that I would like for you to take away from our time here today? Uh, first of all, it goes without saying that getting into a top business school is really hard. Um, I hope that in, in some of the stories that I told here today, some of the anecdotes that I used, I conveyed to you, uh, especially this is useful if you're new to this process, that it's not just about a test score. Like I, I realize that in some parts of the world, um, for example, in India, uh, doing very well on a test like the GMAT, let's say, is like, that's the thing that gets you into school. You do well on the test and that's pretty much it. You're pretty much getting in. It's not at all like that in the US. So just because you get a super high GMAT score, that's great. A high GMAT score is definitely better than a low GMAT score, but it's not enough. It is necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, it does not mean automatic admission because they're going to be looking for that previous track record of success in whatever environment you've been in. Um, and then getting into a top school, yeah, I mean, or going to a top school, yeah, it's really expensive. Uh, but think about it in the long term. Think about some of the long term doors it can open. Uh, think about the fact that a lot of these post MBA jobs pay enough. You know, even if you only, let's say you are in the US on a on sort of a, an international visa and you only get three years if you do this the STEM designated. MBA, you get you only guaranteed three years of working in the U.S. afterwards. Even with the three years, I was actually uh, I was talking to someone uh, last night who who is from a, a developing country, and and I was like, well, what's going to happen if you don't if you have to go back after a couple years? And he was like, well, I'm saving tons of money, and I think I'll be not maybe not completely done with the low repayment loan repayment, but I'm going to be in a pretty good in a pretty good place. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, if you work for an, an NGO or nonprofit, there are often loan reduction or loan forgiveness programs. Um, also, it can help you switch into a career that you otherwise probably could not make a switch into. I didn't really touch upon this in the past because uh, we were sort of, I just wanted to make that sort of like, hey, here's the average salary. Uh, but it, you know, the thing we didn't really get into is that really only in business school can someone who's worked 
in the nonprofit sector for several years, go to business school, and then end up getting a job at Microsoft <laughs> that pays 10 times what they were making uh, before, or you know, pivoting again. Let's say you've never worked in real estate, and I just said two slides ago that real estate is actually like one of the best ways to build wealth. And you're like, oh wow, if that's true, let me, I want to get into real estate too. Like if you don't currently work in real estate, you can't just walk into a real estate office or a real estate private equity firm and be like, hey, I don't know anything about what you guys do here, but I'm smart. So just, you know, hire me. You can't do that. But if you get an MBA and you take the right classes, blah, 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 you can make that transition. Uh, and then the network. Uh, people talk about the network all the time. And the reason it's so valuable, uh, it's not just, you know, because it, you know, it, it's basically because you're going to be surrounded by people who make positive change, who are driven to make positive change, uh, whether in nonprofits or in the workforce. And so by being surrounded by those people, not just in school, but for the many years after school, uh, it's you're just sort of surrounded by uh, people who are just as committed to, I wrote, just as committed to hustling as you are. So people who have that positive energy, uh, there's something to be said for having a group of friends that you take with you for the rest of your life uh, that have those attributes, not only because they can be helpful for you professionally, or they can be helpful for you if you're making some sort of let's, a real estate investment, uh, but also just because it's nice, it's nice to be around people like that. <laughs> um, so before I end here, here are all the different pieces of an MBA application. They all have to move together. Otherwise the machinery comes screeching to a grinding halt and at Applicant Lab, I help teach you how to make the pieces of your machinery flow together. It is a competitive process, uh, but there are definitely uh, ways for you to tell your story in a way that maximizes your chances of getting in. Right? There's no such thing as like an essay that will guarantee that you get in, that's preposterous. But to the extent that many of you in the applicant pool look really similar on paper to a lot of other people in the applicant pool, the ability to tell your story and tell it well can often make the difference. You know, if they're going to, if they're looking at say 50 different product managers who all work in the enterprise software space and they're like, we got to pick two out of the 50, often what makes the difference is the way in which the story is told. So just a reminder, Applicant Lab costs $349 versus the $8,000 plus admissions consultants will charge, which is less than one hour of my time or with someone of, with an expert of my caliber. Um, and by that, I mean, there are other admissions consultants out there who charge, who might charge a little bit less, but they usually do not. They Maybe they did not themselves attend a top MBA or maybe they don't have a lot of experience. So when I say the three forty nine an hour, I'm referring to people of my of my level of expertise and experience. Okay, so that is my presentation. Uh, we've got about. Let me exit out of this. Ooh, hello, I'm back again. I'm in the show. Nice. Everyone can hear and see you. Nice. Okay, so I've got what 12, 12 minutes left. So 12 minutes, I'm going to jump into the comments and see if we can cover the comments. Oh, someone just said, hi, Maria, just came to say hi. Hi, what's so Japanese? How kind of you. We live in a world in which people are not being kind. So that is very kind. Tina, hi from Miami. Tina, I used to live in Miami. In my roaring 20s, I spent a year living on South Beach. It was a pretty crazy year. Um, don't tell my mom that though. Aman, hi Aman from Delhi, India. Nice to meet you. Oh, Abhijit very kindly posted a link to the previous video where Shovik and I dished the dirt on rankings. Um, oh, Dushyant, you you stay home. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that I can. As long as we are all quarantining during the pandemic. <laughs> And we're stuck at home no matter what. I, I am glad that I am able to provide at least some level of entertainment. Hi, Amit. Okay, Hindi, Abhidit, Maria is the best one. This is great. I should just do these every day. I should just like record these very nice comments on the side. And then if there aren't nice comments, I'll just cut those out. Uh, and then I'll just look at this all the time. Okay, Nafiz, there are great schools for MBA in China, but lack worldwide appeal. Nafiz, this is a great point. So... I think this is, remember, I think I, well, there's, I, I said a lot of things just now in the past 48 minutes, but one of the things um, I, th I think I may have mentioned is that one person's top MBA may not be another person's top MBA, right? So if somebody, look, if somebody wants to live in London or 
Atlanta, Georgia, or yeah, maybe getting a Chinese MBA is probably not the best idea because people in those cities might not really have heard of the different MBAs in China or, you know, university, national technical university of Singapore. I think I just butchered that, but you know what I mean? They might not know the Asian ones. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to work in China <laughs> and you want uh, experience with Chinese cultural norms and you want to maybe try to learn a little bit of Mandarin as hard as that is, and you, I mean, absolutely, uh, there is an enormous amount of potential with China. I think, you know, China and India, I know there's a lot of tension going on right now, but I think at the end of the day, economic ties will always beat out everything else. So I do think that whenever com countries are economically intertwined, um, they tend to, they might, there might be some saber rattling and some, some conflict on the military side, but Put those people away. Uh, the economics are always going to win out. Uh, and so yeah, there's a lot going on, I think, with China's economy and China. Um, I think China, for example, China linking with India, I think I think those two, I think that those are the two emerging economies in the world right now that are becoming the giants. Uh, and trust me, the U.S. is <laughs> the U.S. is stepping us up. We have we have been uh, a top country in the world for a while. And now apparently we have a president who's like, never mind. Um, so I think uh, I think it, uh, MBA programs in China can be wonderful if you are. I, I actually believe so much in China. I'm not just paying lip service to this. I believe so much in the future of China, and I, I do think that China and India are both going to be the drivers of the economy for the next century. That I actually I have, as I mentioned, I have a son. My son has actually been studying Mandarin Chinese since he was four, and he's ten now. Um, so I pretty much for, I don't force him to do a lot, but I force him to study Mandarin because I believe so much in China. So I don't know, Nafisa, if that was the point you were trying to make, but I interpreted it as that point and I agree with that point. Uh, okay, why don't we consider the interest for the initial call? Look, I, like I said, I was just overly simplifying it. Like, you know, okay, $224,000 and $224,781 at 3% interest with 8% interest, whatever. I over, I, I bumped it up to 250 divided it by 25 years. Will it be more than 250 with interest? Maybe. Will you work for more than 25 years? Maybe. It was just for a, to make a sort of kind of a thought exercise. Um, sorry, I, I did something and now I, I scrolled. I went to the very bottom of the comments. Hold on. Ah. Okay. Oh, now Chirag is asking, what are the parameters considered to figure out amongst has the best long-term 25-year potential? Okay. So Chirag, great question. This is a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, the way that you prove leadership potential is by having a track record of driving positive change uh, wherever you've been. So if you, uh, for example, younger people, uh, they may not have a super long track record yet in the workforce, but maybe in college, they were the leaders of the student government. And not only were they the leaders, but they started a new initiative and they doubled the, they, I don't know, they led a fundraiser that had three times as much revenue as the previous fundraising chair was able to get. Um, or they talk with the administration and they convince the administration to do something, you know, administrations never want to do anything. And so, you know, so, so people who take leadership roles, uh, who basically step up to say, okay, I have my job. I show up at nine, I end at seven or eight or whatever, and I'm given a task, a list of things to do. And I'm just going to do that list. And as soon as the list is over, I'm going to go home and watch Netflix, right? Those sorts of people who are competent, but not assertive, initiative takers, those folks usually do not have success in the elite MBA admissions game, right? It really is about people taking initiative, uh, people identifying problems that other people either have not identified in the past or they identified, but were like, oh, I don't feel like dealing with this. And so they <laughs> they sweep it under the rug. And so people are, you know, people who tend to be more successful in this process are like, hey, like, why did we sweep this under the rug? Why have we done this this way? Why, why don't we do this? Why don't we change our hiring practices to, for example, eliminate the names and, and any gender, any sort of gender or ethnicity language in the resume? So that way we can try to get rid of our unconscious hiring biases. Uh, why don't we launch a new service, uh, a mobile version of our platform? Why haven't we ever done this? So those are the people who are like, huh, like they sort of, 
there's like, here's my task that I have to do today. Uh, but let me look up and around and see, well, how else can I make change? And then they sort of raise their hands and then they're able to successfully lead change. So people who either have done that or who show the potential to do that, who show seeds of taking initiative, who show the seeds of being able to persuade and motivate others. So for example, if you're leading a team uh, at work, maybe you, you're like, Maria, my company does not let me propose new things. Like, that's just not how we work. Fine. Uh, but maybe you have a story about a time when everyone on your team wanted to quit and they were sick of it. They were up to here and they were ready to quit. And you were like, no, we are going to finish this project and we're going to make it happen. Uh, and so that could be a great way, for example, to show that you have that ability to inspire others. Okay. Prathmesh is asking GMAT and GPA requirements for Indian non-engineering mail. I mean, the Indian non-engineers versus Indian engineers, it's, it, the Indian bucket is more similar than it is different. Um, you know, I have another, I have another video that I did. Oh, I should have pulled it up. The link, I, I think the point is, okay. So on average, if you look at the scores, um, like GMAC will often publish GMAT scores by country, the averages, and on average, test takers in India tend to do about 30 points higher than test takers in other countries. Um, a lot of that is some of its intelligence and some of it is hard work, but a lot of it is also because in India, like I mentioned before, apparently it's a very test driven culture, right? And so, you know, since since some of you have grown up in a culture in which you're constantly being tested all the time, uh, whereas here in the US, for example, the testing thing doesn't really ever like you take maybe one test in high school and that may or may not help you get into college. So it's just not the same culture. Uh, and so Indian applicants to business school tend to do better on the GMAT in part because they work harder, but, but, but it's also because like, it's just when you get used to testing after a while, it just becomes a little bit easier. So based on that, the typical rule of thumb is that you, if you're from India, ideally you will look at the average GMAT score for a school and your score will be about 30 points higher. Now, does that mean that like, okay, the average score is 720, that means I need a 750. If I get a 750, I'm getting in? No. It also doesn't mean the average is a 720, I didn't get a 750, up, oh, I'm doomed. No, it doesn't mean that either. Because if you think about those positive change maker attributes that I was talking about before, someone with a lower GMAT score, but who has really moved mountains, like who has really like, you know, works at a large company, got that large company to establish a new division. Um, or I had I had another client once a couple of years ago who got into both Harvard and Stanford with a 700 GMAT. He wasn't from India, but he was from another competitive, com you know, very, okay, it's China, fine. <laughs> I'm like, I was trying to like be confidential and I'm like, whatever. The other competitive country that we all know about is China. So this person yeah, their GMAT was below whatever, but guess what? They worked for a huge company and this company, this guy's company had sent him to different countries around the world to either set up the companies, new operations in new countries, or to turn around a failing part of the business. I mean, all in, this person generated, I would say, half a billion dollars of value by the time he applied to business school between turning around failing divisions, launching new divisions. Um, so guess what? That guy got into Stanford and Harvard with only a 700. <laughs> of course, wouldn't you, if you're the venture capitalist trying to pick the people who are going to be successful, aren't you going to go with the guy who's already created hundreds of millions of dollars? Not rocket science. And you're, are you, aren't you going to say like, well, the GMAT's not super high, but who cares? <laughs> So that's sort of an extreme example. But on average, the average rule of thumb is to be competitive as an Indian candidate. You want to aim for about 30 points higher. PN wants to know, how can you do an MBA freely? How can I do MBA freely learning? How can I do MBA? Free okay, sorry. I think I think PN, your, your, your comment accidentally posted several times. So if you want an MBA degree for free, I want to say you get what you pay for. Um, you can get the knowledge. First of all, if you just want the knowledge involved with an MBA, like you're like, I don't care about actually getting the degree. I just want to learn finance and accounting, whatever. There's all kinds of free MOOCs, Coursera, all that sort of stuff. If you want a certified like MBA from an accredited institution for free, the easiest way to do that is to go, you'll have to go below top 10, top 15, top, you'll have to go to like 
maybe like a, a school ranked like 80th, right? But if your GMAT score, speaking about GMAT scores, if your GMAT score is say, let's say you have a 750 and their average is a 610, they know that letting you in is going to boost that, boost their average up quite a bit. So those schools, if you have a pretty strong GMAT score, the lower you go down the list, the more likely you are to get money. Because think of it from the school's perspective. They want to attract people so that way their school starts to look better. If they attract better people coming in, the better people are going to start coming out. And then the school's brand gets elevated as a result, which is why some schools are so excited and so willing to throw money at candidates that they think would otherwise go to a higher school. And so they're like, here, let me give you a lot of money so you come to my school instead. And then you graduate and become really famous. Excuse me. And then people say, wow, that, you know, that random school in the middle of nowhere is actually pretty good. So I hope those are the two ways you could either take classes uh, for free or, or try to go to a lower ranked school. Although I would caution you that the, uh, the employment results from those lower, like I, I mentioned this a second ago and then I realized I did not elaborate. You do kind of get what you pay for though. The, res the career results from those lower ranked schools, yeah, you might get the degree for free or for very little money, but maybe on the other end, some of those opportunities might not exist. Um, Pradesh asks, how can the international students from India repay the loan considering that companies are hesitating to provide sponsorship after three years? No, it's true, Pradesh. So like I said, like I mentioned before, I mentioned, um, I mentioned someone that I spoke with yesterday to prepare for today's presentation, uh, who is from India. And like I said, like this person is living frugally post business school. And they are trying to make as much money as possible. <laughs> and they chose a pretty high paying job. Uh, and so I will this person be able to pay off the loan completely in three years? Maybe not completely, but is this person going to put a pretty big dent in that loan in three years? Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, the, uh, how can I put this? The Even if you do end up going back to India, the opportunities available to you, you know, yeah, will you be making more money? Will you be making less money in US dollar terms? Yeah, probably. But, you know, if you go to Harvard Business School and you move back to India and you're part of the Harvard Business School Alumni Association there, uh, you are going to have more opportunities than you might have if you went to another school. And again, to reiterate something I said earlier, at the end of the day, it's a risk. It's, you know, very few things in life are a given. Death and taxes, right? So aside from death and taxes, the only things we can't count on anything in life. And so, yeah, it, it might be a huge financial risk. But if you're not willing to take that risk for yourself, then why should, why should the venture capitalists <laughs> take that risk on you as well? Kahindi, oh, super insightful. Thank you, Kahindi. You're so nice. Um, what sort of help is provided by Applicant Lab to MBA applicants? So it, super quickly, uh, a lot of the advice that MBA admissions consultants, so other MBA admissions consultants, how they work is that they're like, oh, you have to buy like an eight hour package with us. And then we'll call you on the phone and we'll do a Skype thing and we'll talk about this. And I'll tell you about how to write a resume. Uh, and then they charge a ton of money per hour. Instead of doing that, I just pre-recorded a ton of the advice and you can go through it on your own time, on your own schedule. And since it's sort of digital and therefore scalable, I don't have to charge as much money. Uh, and then on top of that, if you would like to purchase additional time, you can purchase time with me or my colleagues. I'm building out a team right now, uh, a woman named Karin, who's a Booth alumna. We've got uh, a Columbia alum, a Ross alum, and a Wharton alum who are also joining our team or have joined our team recently, who are also, you can, if you go through the lab and you want to hire one of us to sort of, you know, give a quick once over, uh, you can do that as well. Do, 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 do. Hello, miss. Hello to you, Satyam. Uh, Rainer, join lately. I like how you're engaging with the audience. Thank you. Uh, I had quite a bit of caffeine this morning, so it seems to be kicking in. What would you say is the lowest ranking one should consider for business school? Top 25. So, Chana, that's a good question. I, I <laughs> hmm. Off the top of my head, I'd say yes, uh, but below the top of my head? Thinking about it a little bit more deeply, I it really depends on, and I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm saying it depends because it really does depend. For example, uh, where do you want to live after graduation, right? So let's say you want to live in the South. So if you want to live in the South because you have family there and 
for a million other reasons, it's where you want to be. Guess what? Emory is an amazing school. Uh, Tulane in Louisiana would be an amazing school. One of the schools in Florida would be an amazing school, right? So those, because those local schools, for example, don't underestimate the power of geographic proximity, right? If, if a school's career center is based in a certain city, those career network, those career, sorry, those career center employees are going to be networking with all of the local companies. Uh, and so in terms of getting a job, like I, you know, uh, I worked in entertainment before business school and I was trying to work in entertainment and I continued to work in entertainment afterwards. And, you know, I lost out a job. I, I was cons being considered for a job. Um, I was a finalist for it and I lost out on it me from Harvard to someone who was from UCLA. And the reason was they were, they were like, it's nothing against you. It's just that this particular woman did a project with our department last semester. And we worked with her on her project and we know her. And so it's no offense to you, Maria, but we're going to hire the girl that we've known for six months. And I was like, you know what? I don't blame you. Right. I would probably do the same thing. Well, go with what you know. Uh, and so don't, don't, you know, when, when people start getting into the, some of the different rankings of the schools spaced wherever, you know, if you want to live in Austin or in Texas, oh my God, go to UT Austin or really strongly consider UT Austin because they're going to connect you with the local employers. You're going to be doing projects with the local employers. You're going to get, so do you see what I'm saying? Like, I think that that's where the, some of the rankings where it's like, is it top 25? Is it top 23? Is it top 27? Eh. I would, I would look at the career outcome reports uh, and really look at like what types of companies are hiring. Are those the companies I want to go to? For example, I'll give you one more example and then I'll move on. Um, Vanderbilt university, their MBA program. If you want to work in healthcare, OMG, you guys like other MBA programs are like, Oh, maybe 3% of our graduates go into healthcare or maybe 6% of our graduates go into healthcare at Owen Vanderbilt. It's like 22% of their graduates go into healthcare. Uh, so if you're interested in healthcare, I don't know what Vanderbilt's ranking is. Let's say for the sake of argument that it's not in the top 25, I think it might be, but let's just say it's not. If you want to live in the southern part of the U.S. and if you want to work in healthcare, guess what? Vanderbilt is now should be one of your top choices because of the opportunities it's going to give you. So I didn't have like an exact cutoff numeric cutoff to for your question, but I hope I gave you some things to think about uh, in terms of how to how to look at those those schools. Um, my shed. Hello from Dubai. Hi. You know, I really was thinking. I was hoping to go to Dubai either this year or next year, but then COVID hit. And so now we're all stuck at home. My son is obsessed with skyscrapers. Every kid gets obsessed with their own thing. For him, it's skyscrapers. And I was like, oh, we're going to go to the Burj Khalifa and someday, not this day. Uh, what are the prospects for an MBA post 30s? Great, great question. Uh, it's harder. That it, it, it's hard, you know, people sometimes are like, oh, MBA programs, they don't let in people in their mid thirties. And that's so ageist. And that's so discriminatory. Um, maybe a little, but it's also because the employers don't want to hire people in their mid thirties. Uh, and because the people in the mid thirties often don't want the post MBA jobs, right? People in their mid thirties, like the post MBA recruiters come to campus with, you know, we have 30 associate jobs that we're trying to fill. And they're all the same level. And so the 27-year-old is interviewing for the same job as the 37-year-old. And if they both get it, they're both going to be associates at, let's say, the bank after business school. And so oftentimes, I think sometimes this is another thing that people don't always think about. Like, let's say you are in your mid-30s and you apply to business school and you get in. And then that's when people tend to start asking the hard questions. Uh, this should have happened a little sooner. I was like, well, wait a minute. Like when I graduate, since I'll be so much older, I'm going to be like a VP, right? And it's like, well, probably not because the recruiters are recruiting for a certain position. <laughs> like you can maybe network your way and talk your way into a higher level. Uh, but so then that's also when a lot of people in their mid to late 30s are like, well, wait a minute. Why am I like, I shouldn't be working at the same level as some 28 year old. That's sort of offensive. <laughs> so it also, it, it's, it's harder to get into business school, but because the business schools are trying to do people a favor. Um, now the bi the big reason or the big reason, the big way that people tend to get in into their mid thirties is if they were doing many, something else for many years. So if they were getting a PhD for many years, or if they were in the military for many years, 
if you've been in the workforce for 10 or 15 years, a lot of business schools, full-time business schools, of course, there are, there are executive programs for more seasoned people, but the typical full-time MBA is not going to let you in, in part because they know that you're probably not going to want the jobs <laughs> that their recruiters are coming to campus for. Um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, Gaurav Sharma, Applicant Lab is a great platform. I managed to get an interview call from one of my top preferences. What? Gaurav, drop me an email. Let me know where. I'd love to, I'd love to hear your update. Um, oh, and then Majed, any M MBA applicants who already have a master's degree from a top UK school? Look, it's tough, right? Because not only are you older, but now you're also saying, well, I already got a master's, but now I want to do another master's. And it's almost like... Okay, well, why didn't you just do the MBA the first time around? If And by that, I'm assuming you mean like a master's in finance or a master's in something business related. That can be, it's not impossible, but it can be a tough argument to make of like, well, why didn't you do an MBA before? Like, why did you do this other businessy related master's before? Obviously, if it's a master's in chemical engineering, then that's not a down, that's not considered a downside. Kevin wants to know, you don't consider that ranking is that important, right? Um by that, just to be clear, I mean the specific ranking in terms of like, is the school ranked seventh versus fifth? That sort of that doesn't really matter. It depends. Like, there, there, the 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 schools are more in buckets than they are in specific rankings, and um, you know, different different schools specialize in different things. I hopefully my little story just now of me losing it. Like, you know, I think a lot of MBA applicants before they get into the process are like, well. If she went to Harvard, of course she's going to get. She, she's up for a job. The Harvard graduate is up for a job with against the UCLA graduate. Of course, the Harvard graduate is going to get it because Harvard is ranked number one and UCLA is ranked whatever it is. But there are so many things that go into getting a job that it's like no, don't. It doesn't necessarily mean it. Um, and to be clear, I did not automatically expect that I was going to get, <laughs> get a job. I just tell that story because people sometimes are like, really? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Well, it makes perfect sense. I don't blame them. I would have done the same thing. Uh, la, la, la. So, but but overall rankings, in terms of, just to finish that thought, the, the buckets of rankings in terms of being directionally correct, I think there is value to that uh, in terms of, you know, and if you look at the, you know, the different, again, this is going to de depend on what you want to do for a living. If you want to do real estate, go to Columbia for the love of God. <laughs> they have like a million real estate uh, offerings and New York is the real estate capital of the U S and so you can get all kinds of internships and projects with real estate firms. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so that's one example. Uh, do you get scholarships for EMBA programs? Yeah, no, EMBA programs almost never offer scholarships. Pretty much never. The anticipation is that if you are, the idea is that if you're qualified enough to get into an executive, if you're qualified enough to get into Wharton's executive MBA program, you should either have the money to pay for it, you should be willing to take out a loan to pay for it, or your employer uh, should be willing to pay for some, if not all of it. So it is, in my experience, it's really hard to get scholarships for EMBAs. Is there a reasonable recognition of NUS outside of Singapore in the UK and rest of you? So Anoop, I can't really answer your question because I don't live in the UK and Europe, but my guess would be probably not, certainly not compared to say INSEAD or London Business School. Aman Tomar, I've gotten an admit to a top 10 USMBA school, but I had to defer. I want to maximize my chances of getting a scholarship by applying to other schools. Um, does Applicant Lab help in such cases? Well, I mean, to the extent that Applicant Lab can help you perhaps write a stronger application or tell your story in a more effective way. It can. Uh, one of the other ways also to try to increase your your scholarship chances is bluntly to get take retake the GMAT and do significantly better. How important are career services in terms of choosing a school, Juan Pablo? Uh, yo creo que es muy importante. You know, I, I think the career services, like I said, the career services at UCLA is like buddy, buddy, best friends with every single, with Netflix and Fox and Disney uh, in a way that obviously the career services group at a place like Harvard can't be because they're 3,000 miles away. Uh, so I think that the career services is really important. So I would really be a, be a discerning customer and look at that, some of that career data. Rainer wants to know, any tips on how to tackle the application with a little over two years of work experience? Oh, Rainer. I'm not trying to be flippant. I'm not trying to be a difficult person, but if you only have a two, two years of work experience, I would tell you that the easiest way to tackle it is to not apply and to wait. 
Um, and the reason I say that is that when we think about, when we think back to that whole thing of like the, the positive impact and having a track record of positive impact as an indicator of future negative, you know, future negative impact. What? Hmm. Uh, maybe if you're like Jared Kushner, I don't, anyway, sorry. I'm getting political. Uh, it, you know, future previous impact being assigned for future impact, being assigned for even more future impact. Uh, the problem, Rainer, is that when people are only two years out of college, they may not have had the opportunity to have had that level of impact yet. It doesn't mean that they're never going to have it. It just means that because they're young, they haven't had the same opportunity. So in my experience, when people get into top MBA programs at the two year ish post graduate post college graduation mark, it's because their achievements are on par with that with those of people at the four to five year mark. Right. So I did have someone with only two years of work experience get into Harvard, last, Harvard Business School last year. But this person's recommender basically was like, he is leading the department and it's people who are 15 years older than he is. And he is the leader of the department. He is he is operating at a, at a level of impact that is extraordinary for someone his age. So, yeah. So that guy got into Harvard. Why? Because the age was not a barrier. Like he was performing at this level. My, my hand is off the screen. He was performing at this level, even though his age was down here. So you can get in, but realize that the bar for those two years, the amount that you will have been expected to accomplish, to have accomplished in those two years is going to be a lot higher. Shovik, shouldn't you be at work, Shovik? Shovik, the bottom of the comments are the best ones, especially if they're from Shovik. How are you doing, Shovik? I hope you're having a great day. I won't tell your boss that you're here. Um, What's the average age of GMERT Asper? I, it's normally around Elfie, just 27, 26. Uh, I probably need to go. We were supposed to actually end 15 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting Abhiji to jump in at any minute and be like, cut it, stop, shut up. Um, DRN wants to know general MBA. I've five experience, you have five years of experience in your family business, you want to go for an MBA. Darren, family businesses can be a great background to get into an MBA, primarily because the admissions officers don't need to worry about you finding a job. So if your family's business is large enough that you can presumably graduate and pay off the student loan, getting employment at your family's company, it's a great it really helps a lot, right? Because it, now you've taken that burden, that stress off of the admissions committee of like, oh God, what if we let them in and they can't get a job and they don't have to worry about it so much. Um, as a random side note, Deering, if you if you really are committed to your family business, I would look at one year MBA programs. And also there's a, there's a program at Columbia Business School called the J-Term program uh, that you don't do a summer internship, but you graduate in less time. So it's sort of an accelerated MBA. You sacrifice the summer internship, but if you're applying for a, if you're going to go back to your family business anyway, you won't apply for a summer internship either way. So think about that. Uh, will Applicant Lab help one shortlist B schools? So uh, to answer your, to answer that question, I I don't have like an automatic magic tool that where you type in some stuff and it goes beep, boop, 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 beep, boop, and it tells, but I, I tell you how to do the research to try to figure it out on your own. Uh, for example, oh, best faculty in private equity. Oh, well, no, who's, I mean, you don't get a job in private equity unless you've already worked in private equity or you've worked in investment banking prior to business school. It does not matter what school you go to. You could go to Stanford. You could go to Booth. You could go to Stanford and Booth and Harvard back to back to back to back. Uh, and you won't get a job in private equity after business school unless you've already worked in it or, or investment banking at a top investment bank. Uh, so it's good. To, it's good to look into that stuff, but just be realistic. Talk to students. Talk to students. Reach out to the private equity club and say, how many of you guys actually got jobs in private equity last year? And then they'll say, oh, not that many. Or they'll say a bunch. And you'll say, great, what were their backgrounds before business school? And then they will tell you. You can say, did anyone did anyone career switch into private equity? They will say no. Or they might say like one person, but that person like, it's Jamie Dimon's daughter <laughs> or something. <laughs> okay, well, she was able to make the switch, but a lot of other people weren't. Is the master's in finance better than an MBA if you want to keep working in finance? Look, Vivek, if you love finance, and that's what you want to do and you're like quanty and you love the quant stuff. I yeah, do that. It's cheaper, it's easier to get into, it's faster. Are female engineers in an advantage? Um 
I th- not okay. Yes and no. Yes, female engineers are an advantage, but not because they're female engineers, but because female engineers, since they tend to not be as well respected in the workforce, when if a female engineer, let's say, is put in charge of a team of people who are 10 years older than she is, and they're all men and they're all they're all these old dudes, a female engineer is gonna have a harder time just because people are sexist, she's going to have a harder time perhaps getting those people to listen to what she has to say. And so in that context, female engineers have an advantage insofar as if they're working with people who tend to be sexist and they're able to get those people to follow them and they're able to get those people to do what they want to do, then it is seen as being a little bit more impressive. Um, just because the barrier is a little bit higher, but simply like I'm a female engineer, let me in like that by itself doesn't necessarily mean a lot. It's, it's more of like the context upon the context against which your leadership accomplishments will be judged. Do they base it on ethnic background versus citizenship, Chinese American versus Chinese? So Nico, uh, it is primarily uh, citizenship when we're talking about foreign, foreign students versus, you know, international students. Uh, how background checks are conducted with previous employers. I mean, look, this is really be well beyond the scope of today's <laughs> today's discussion. They hire a background firm. The firms call up your previous employers and say, what were the dates of employment? What was the salary and all kinds of basic stuff. But um, are minor gaps in employment really an issue? Anything over three months does need to be reported. You need to report it on your application. Most schools explicitly ask, have you been unemployed for more than three months? If so, tell us what you did with that time. Tell us why you were unemployed. Tell us what you did with that time. So it's not a huge issue because a lot of people, especially now with COVID, a lot of people are getting laid off. Um, but you do need to do something useful with that time and not just watch TV and eat ice cream, even though I would not judge you for doing so. You have to have something else also that you're doing during that time to show them that you're a go-getter. And then Devence Rose also wants to know how does scholarship work? I mean, what's the man maximum annual income for HBS? I mean, this is really, sorry, beyond the scope. You'll, you'll have to go to the financial aid page at HBS uh, yourself. But HBS, yeah. I mean, the need-based scholarships are pretty pretty clear. If you don't make a lot of money, you're going to get more of a scholarship. And if you already make a lot of money, you're not going to get as much of a scholarship. Uh, uh, okay, Abhijit wants to know, I have average academics. Can I get into top B schools? Abhijit, if, you're, if your leadership profile is awesome, then the academics take more of a back seat. However, there is sort of a bare minimum that you have to of, of academic competency that you have to prove, right? Because the school doesn't want to let someone in who's going to struggle. Uh, because then that person's going to be unhappy. The student's going to be unhappy. The professor's going to be unhappy that they have a slow student in the class. Uh, the student's going to be depressed. They might even drop out because they're like, oh, this is too hard. What am I doing? So it's it's a, a bad result all around for everyone when someone is led into a program who cannot academically keep up. So you do need to demonstrate at least a basic level to, of academic competence. Uh, but beyond that, if your academics are not strong, the good news is if your leadership and your personal skills are super strong, that'll make, that'll more than make up for it. Uh, we, I almost, I think, you know what we're going to do, we're going to do a few more minutes of this and then I, I do think I need to go. Encore works in the drone industry. Does experience from startups help? So I'm not trying to, when I say it depends, I'm not trying to like avoid the question. Here's the thing. Startups can definitely, startups is a double-edged sword, like with many things. Startups, the bad news is no one's ever heard of your company. No one knows, is your company legitimate? Or is it like you and your brother in a garage and maybe like you ask your dad to give you $50,000 and he's like, sure, kids, just stay out of my hair, don't go to jail. And so you started a company Right. But some people, some people do this in case you're like, that's crazy. What is crazy talk? What is she? I've, I've seen it happen uh, where people start nonprofits or they start companies. And really it's because they're wealthy and their parents are like, here's a check. Just, just don't get into too much trouble. And it's not like a real company. Um, so the, the, ba- so, so the tricky thing is, is establishing credibility of the startup, that it's a real thing. It's a real company. And so one of the ways you do that is you say, we have this many employees. We've raised X millions of dollars. We have a fund. We've raised our Series A from Kleiner Perkins or some sort of sexy VC that people have heard of. That's how you establish that the company is a legitimate company. Um, So the bad news is no one's heard of your company. The good news is most people in startups, by definition, get to have a lot more impact then they do at large companies. So assuming that you've taken advantage of that opportunity, 
to make that impact and sort of go to the CEO and be like, CEO, we need to be doing things differently around here. And, you know, I, I found a seven new clients who are going to give us a lot of money. If, uh, like that sort of initiative, uh, people with a lot of initiative can really shine in startup environments. So net net, it can often be a positive for the right type of person. Oh, the supply chain domain, Arash, Arsh, sorry, Arsh, I don't know a lot about supply chain expertise. I'm sorry. I The most famous ones off the top of my head in supply chain are Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Ross, which is Michigan. Oh, and that's it. I'm, that's, that's such a, that's kind of a, a relatively niche, niche area. Uh, so I don't know off the top of my head, but you can also look at the career vision, career vision, the career reports and ask and call if there's an operations club at the school, call them up and say, how many people get supply chain jobs? How good is your supply chain? Coursework. A dual degree, Vidit wants to know, should I get a dual degree from a below average college or an MBA from a branded college? Depends on what you want to do, but I am not a big fan of dual degrees. I tend to think they are a waste of time and money. Uh, so I would pick the MBA from the branded college if it were me. If you get into a reach school, does it lower your chances of getting a dream job because you're more competitive? Uh, no. It doesn't. Like if Bain or McKinsey, if McKinsey comes to your campus, they're looking for the smartest people possible. Um, and sometimes I, what was it? I did an interview. I, I do a weekly podcast with another large MBA publishing company, <laughs> kind of a competitor to GMAT Club. I do a weekly podcast uh, with them. And a few months ago, I actually interviewed uh, the head of global recruiting for Bain Consulting, or I was one of people, one of three people interviewing him. And he said something like, there are times when we, you know, we might go to a school and be expecting to hire five people and we're just so impressed with the people we hire 10 or we might go to a school one year and expect to hire five people and maybe for whatever reason, we just don't like what we see and we only hire one. So it's not, you're not being compared necessarily against the other people from the same school. The, uh, McKinsey's not saying we're, we're hiring 20 people from Harvard and that's it. Uh, if people are exceptional, they're going to do well regardless which which school they get into. Um, and also, if you're if other people are more competitive than you, maybe they get that post MBA job, but maybe they then go out into the world and do better things, and then they help you get get a job five years later. Uh, Shovik. Sometimes people in the mid thirties can be successful, but almost always they have a chip on their shoulders. Exactly. They have a chip on their shoulders. They don't want to work alongside. They don't want to report. If you go to business school and you get a job in management consulting and you're 38 years old, there's a very good chance that your boss is going to be 27 and you're going to be reporting to someone who is way younger than you and you are going to have to shut up and take it. And one of the things that's kind of funny is that the older we get, the less willing we are to put up with this stuff. There's a reason why most people only spend two years in management consulting. Because the older you get, the more you're like, wait a minute, why am I jumping? You know, why am I getting up at three in the morning to answer your stupid emails? <laughs> right? Like my time is worth, my life is worth more than this. And so that's why there's enormous turnover in that industry. Uh, and so that's why they like younger people because younger people don't talk back. <laughs> but those of us who are older tend to, we tend to get grumpier. Uh, Babar, what are the other programs like Sloan Fellows, Executive? Uh, so other similar programs, Sloan Fellows at MIT, Sloan Fellows at LBS, Stanford MSX, um, Cornell has a one-year MBA. I believe you already need some other master's degree. Kellogg has a one-year MBA. Those are the ones off the top of my head. European programs also tend to be more open to older candidates and they tend to be one-year programs. So look at those. Um, someone wants to know why do the top rankings tend to be U.S. schools, primarily because the U.S. schools are the most famous or the most established, right? Some of the U.S. MBA programs have been around for over 100 years. Uh, the MBA program was in many ways pioneered in the U.S., so it makes sense to me that the most established programs with the longest track records are going to be seen as the more successful ones. Uh, but that's not to say you won't get a great education at a newer, less ranked school. But it's one of the many reasons why I think the U.S. programs tend to be the most highly ranked in general. 
how much do I think the parent school matters for the international applicant? That's a great question. I can't really answer that because I, um, I, you know, you would have to do your own homework into like, let's say you're talking about a Duke Fuqua, you'd have to do your own homework in your own country about Duke and say like, okay, well maybe, and I'm just picking Duke randomly. I have no idea what Duke's, um, what Duke said. Uh, your, you know, reputation is in other countries, but you'll have to reach out and be like, okay, is there a big Duke alumni club in my country? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I don't know. Um, I, that's, that's, that's a level of, of detail that I think only you can answer that for yourself, right? I, the, the alumni, the alumni network, uh, is going to matter. And also, but also, like I said before, what you accomplish in the, that post MBA job is also going to matter a lot. If you show up to an employer who is hiring a VP of growth marketing and you're like, hey, I helped quadruple the revenues of this one company in one year, they're not going to be like, you know, oh, but wait a minute, you went to, you know, you went to UT Austin and I haven't heard of that. Like, I don't think that at a certain point, the accomplishments matter more than the school. What you said about associate jobs in the mid thirties does apply to international candidates wanting to work outside the U.S. in Europe. Undergrad is a five year, one gap year. The average. So, uh, so the European programs do tend to average a little bit higher on the age scale, but not that much higher, right? The average age in SEAD, I believe is 29 versus in mother, m many other, most other U S programs the average age might be around 27. Uh, but the average age is not thirty. The average age is not thirty-seven. The average age is a little bit. Um, it's a little bit higher, but it's not like ten years higher. Uh, Gopal is in Sayad impossible without international experience. Gopal, I, I I hate to tell you, but yes, it is almost impossible. Uh, the only sort of saving grace you might have is even if you have never worked abroad, if you work heavily with international clients and international teams. And you've demonstrated an ability to, to work cross-culturally with people who are very, very different from you, maybe. But I don't, th I think it's very rare. I'm trying to go through my head, the files in my head of everyone I know. Most people who get into Insight, if not everyone, has had some sort of significant international experience. Sattvic. What matters more, your B-School name or your current company's brand name? Sattvic depends where you are in life. If you're just a couple years post-MBA, it's going to be the MBA program. And if you're sort of 10 years out, it's probably going to be more your professional accomplishments. Han, you want to know the best way to prep for the interview? I, I'm a little biased. I think the interview portion of Applicant Lab is the best way to prep for the interview. Oh, someone says as an ex employer, I don't think your company brand name matters unless you're changing fields or content. It's what you did that matters much more. Yay. I like you because <laughs> I think my answer was similar to yours. Um, where should an aspiring entrepreneur consider for an MBA? Nico, a lot of people don't actually pursue entrepreneurship right after MBAs. They go into the MBA, they study entrepreneurship, they're super into it. And then they're like, oh my God, I owe $200,000. <laughs> So they go work in Amazon, right? I mean, mo very few. This is another statistic that is easily figure outable from the career reports. How many students go directly from business school to start companies? Stanford is one of the only schools in which that number is significant. I, I want to say it's seven percent, but don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, very few people. If you really want to start a company in the next two years, maybe don't go to business school maybe do like some sort of online entrepreneur boot camp type of thing instead. Uh, Cause it's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. Those two years, things change really quickly. AI is changing quickly. Machine learning is changing quickly. If you've got a great idea for a company right now, maybe you should do it right now <laughs> and not wait. Diversify from finance. Wharton actually has a very strong startup offering. Nico, uh, take a look. Uh, they've got a, they just opened last year, a huge new building that's entirely dedicated to entrepreneurship. They have a semester in San Francisco program where as the name implies, you spend a semester in San Francisco. I've been there. It's a beautiful, it's like right next to the bridge and it's near the Embarcadero. And so it's like, you can network and, um, 
So I think Wharton is actually doing really well when it comes to start. I think I think the semester, I, th I think other schools are following suit. The ones that are not based in San Francisco are starting to open satellite campuses. So Wharton's got, Wharton's one of the strongest, in my opinion, one of the strongest entrepreneurship schools, but very few people in general do entrepreneurship immediately afterwards. A noop, I work in corporate development. I want to continue on the buy side. I'm an APE uh, and you want to do Europe or Asia beyond a, a noop, I don't, I. To, to tell you like how to get a PE job in Europe, uh, especially without previous banking experience. If you're only a few years out of college, maybe you can try to get a pre-MBA job in banking, like an M&A, for example, um, just to really make that a stronger a stronger argument. I, I'm afraid I don't know what's a good school for a career switcher in Europe for PE. Sorry, I know a lot of things, but whew, that's a bit beyond my normal day to day. Nico is pointing out Kellogg's, Chem Kellogg's MMM program or the MIT, the um, their design degree. I know I ugh, I can't remember the initials of it off the top of my head, but I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, that's a great that's a great program. That's a, if you are more product centered, maybe you don't need an MBA. Maybe you get one of those other uh, degrees instead that is more focused on the design element of building new products and bringing them into the world. Gracias, Maria. De nada. De nada, Juan Pablo. Javi wants to know, how is the EA score? I don't know the cutoffs for EA. I've, all I've heard is that the EA is easier <laughs> than the GMAT. So if you have an opportunity to take it, take that instead. Product management consulting. I mean, Samia, the good news is most top 10, 15 schools have good for consulting, that's like the number one thing people do out of business school and product management. I mean, beyond the obvious MIT's, Berkeley's uh, of the world, you know, Booth's, you know, even Kellogg has a good product management track. Uh, most schools today, given the importance of entrepreneurship and digital everything, have created, most of the top schools have created strong product management tracks. So you probably can't go wrong. Uh, Duke has started this, they, they bought this, um, this cool like co-working space in downtown Durham, uh, like it's kind of like an incubator for students to incubate their startup ideas. Every school is getting in on that. So you're going to do okay. I Copenhagen business school. Uh, I, if you want to live in Copenhagen, which I do not, but if you want to live in Copenhagen and you want to learn that language and try to get a job and make a life there, all the power to you. Uh, if not, I'm not really sure that it would be worth it. As a Bangladeshi, is it possible to go to MIT or Sloan? Being Bangladeshi has nothing to do with it. Yes. Uh, if you're a filmmaker, maybe not. It would it would uh, depend a lot about, again, like what is your, like as a filmmaker, have you just made a film that only two people, like your mom and your cousin have watched and they're like, great job. Or have you made films that have generated a lot of money or a lot of buzz or have documentaries that have helped change a government policy, right? Not all films are created equal. Um, so a lot of it depends. Um, Jacob, you are not welcome here. Take your hateful screed on someone else's webinar. Um, is teaching experience bad for an MBA? Uh, not necessarily. Teaching is, can be great. Uh, teaching, first of all, I'm trying to teach my 10 year old now and I suck at it. So if you can convince kids to do things that automatically demonstrates a certain amount of, of a uh, interpersonal skill. I think the challenge for teachers is that there are a lot of teachers who apply, especially those in Teach for America, Teach for India, et cetera. Uh, and so standing out can be tough. So in my experience, the people from say Teach for America who have better results are the ones who, again, instead of applying at the two year mark when they're done with that initial like inner city assignment, they then join the Teach for America national team and they then become sort of more higher level executives or they pursue like they become the principal of a school or something. You know what I mean? Like they go above and beyond. Uh, but teaching by itself can, can be okay. Uh, I would urge you know, I would urge teachers though to try to do something beyond teaching on the resume, whether it's through some other nonprofit activity or getting involved in your principal's task force on COVID, whatever, like sort of stepping up to try to make more of an impact that can help too. Does asking for a need-based scholarship count as a con? Sumi, they're, they're going to find out how little money you have anyway. Like, 
you can pretend that you have more money and that you won't need a need-based scholarship and then you get in and then you ask for a scholarship and they're going to be like, what's happening? <laughs> like you said, you didn't need a scholarship. So I mean, why would you lie about that? If you need a scholarship, tell them you need a scholarship. And if they don't let you in, maybe they're doing you a favor. <laughs> so they're going to find out eventually, I think is my point. Uh, can you go to HB as a filmmaking background? Yeah, I already answered this. Post-study work visa ranking should also be made. Yeah, Nafis, I think that the post, the, I think the, the work visas are, are a little bit more um, employer dependent than they are school dependent. Um, have you heard of the new MBA I degree at Kellogg? I did. They did a webinar for admissions consultants on it like two days ago, and I missed it because I was doing another live <laughs> webinar for a nonprofit that I work with uh, that helps under um, helps underprivileged people apply to MBA programs. So I missed that webinar, but they will be posting it soon. I mean, look, it's essentially a dual degree. It's like so MMM used to be at Kellogg used to be a little bit more technical. And then as the world started shifting more towards snazzy product design and product management, MMM now became more of a design degree. And so I think they're like, oops, we kind of left out the engineering piece. So I think they kind of launched the MBAI to, to balance out offering people either a more design focused, exp design focused experience or a more technical focused experience. I've seen people get into MBA from entertainment industry. I'm one of them. And my husband's one of them. There's a bunch of us. Uh, we have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about <laughs> in our applications <laughs> in the entertainment industry. What do you need pre-MBA to move into a product management track? I, Shiva, I, I would tell you to reach out to the tech clubs at your target schools and ask. Usually, uh, one of the best ways is to have a computer science degree and to have a software software engineering background, right? So that way you can you know that you can communicate with engineers. Hopefully you've had an engineering leadership background. If not, I think it's really valuable to be in a position where you have um, really gotten to know consumers, right? Whether you know what I mean, because a big part of being a good product manager is getting in. I don't want to say getting in the head of consumers, but really understanding like what are the true genuine needs that consumers have, and then how do we address those needs? Um, so that can help a lot. I, oh, 1042, you guys, I really do have to go. So I'm going to answer three more questions, and then I do have to go because I've been here for like forever. <laughs> um, how does recruitment work for online MBA program? And if it doesn't work as well, ask questions, be a, be a savvy consumer. Uh, most people who do online MBA programs, my understanding is that they currently work at a certain company. Uh, for example, oh my God, it's either E and Y or Deloitte, I, or Deloitte E and Y. Oh, I'm getting the two confused, but one of them recently started offering an MBA degree, an online MBA degree from Halt M, uh, Business School, that I believe is free to employees. I don't know any more details beyond that. But so most people who do online MBAs do it because they want the knowledge and they want they plan to stay at their current employer. And they're doing the MBA, the online MBA, primarily for the knowledge. It is not primarily used as a career switching uh, MBA. Okay. Uh, so I said I'd do three more. So let me do, I, I, that was one. Uh, Naman wants to know, I have 3.5 years in data science working with a top tech firm. I mean, Naman, if you want to get hired by a top tech firm post MBA, the good news is any of the top 15 can get you there. If by top tech firm, you mean Amazon, Microsoft, whatever. Uh, other programs you might want to look at, it, both Cornell and NYU have a one-year tech MBA. Uh, that is, as the name implies, it's a pretty, it's a specialized MBA. It's only one year. It's focused on tech. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, their career services teams have excellent uh, relationships with technical recruiters. So those could be alternates uh, that could be good for you to look at. And my final question that I have to, oh, I, there's only, yeah, sorry. Amit saying, school accepts candidate from Fortune 500 and throw them back into top companies. It's like taking money from the rich and giving it back to the rich. Aren't these programs rare? Amit, I, I don't know what, what webinar you were, you were necessarily watching. Uh, I think schools accept candidates who tend to be stars. Uh, it just so happens that a lot of people who are high achievers end up going to Fortune 500 companies. And so, yes, 
a lot of those people can get into top business schools, but they get into the top business schools, not because they were working at a Fortune 500 company, but because of who they are more fundamentally and what leadership skills they possess. So it's not the causality that you're sort of inferring is not I don't believe it's there. It's more that high achievers, the reason business schools attract people over, they sort of over index on people from different companies or different fields. It's not because it's not necessarily because they're like prejudiced against other people. It's because by definition, the high, remember the chicken and the egg, <laughs> the high achievers tend to go into those fields to begin with. And the schools want the high achievers. And so that, but you don't have to go to a fortune 500 company. You can work for teach for America, teach for India. Like I just said, and, and end up at a top program. You can work at a startup and end up at a top program. Uh, it's more about the person and diverse profiles do stand a fair chance. It's a holistic, it's a holistic process. That's why they have you, that's why they force you to write all the stupid essays and get the stupid recommendations and do the, like, if it weren't a holistic process of it, they wouldn't even bother. They would just say, where do you work? Is it a Fortune 500 company? In, boom, stamped, you're in. Um, so it actually is a very fair process in my, I mean, to the extent that it can be given the thousands and thousands of people that apply. Uh, I think, I think, that's my opinion. And we are now almost twice as much over. Oh my God. Private chat. There are all these private chats uh, that have been happening. Oh, poor Abhijit. I'm so sorry. I won't be able to end the live stream from my end. So I need to wait for you. Um, Abhijit, I'm so sorry. I thought that I could end it on my end, which is why I was like, whatever. He's off doing something else, but it doesn't matter. I'll just end it on my own. I'm sorry. You've been waiting up late for me to finish. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm ready to end now but I hope this was useful for all of you. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Uh, one final note, if you found any of this useful, please sign up for the free trial at applicantlab.com. And also please give a like, a click on the like button on this video. So that way, if I get more likes than other admissions consultants, GMAT Club will be more likely to ask me to come back. So show me, show me some of that like love if you liked me, unless if you were that person who was spamming, in which case go away. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Abhijit. I'm ready to end now.